Hello and welcome to episode two of the Athlete Archives, The Spy. This is the story of Mo Berg. If you haven't heard of Mo, he may end up being one of the more unique athletes that I talk about on this podcast. I say that because his athletic career was really nothing special. What makes Mo interesting is, as I'm sure you can guess from the title, he was a spy. Before we get into his clandestine work, let me just cover his background. Mo Berg was born Morris Berg in Harlem, New York on March 2, 1902. He was the third child of Bernard and Rose. Bernard and Rose emigrated to the U.S. from Ukraine, and Bernard bought a pharmacy when he arrived in New Jersey, moved his family to Newark, and this, at that time, was a figurative melting pot of immigrants in that neighborhood from Italy, Ireland, Russia, and so on. Uh, Bernard worked 15-hour days at the pharmacy, but refused to have his children work there. He put a huge emphasis on their academics and their education. And by all accounts, all three of the Berg children were exceptionally gifted students. What separated Mo from his siblings, though, was a passion for baseball. Mo had collected baseball cards when he was younger, the ones that came in cigarette packs. They're commonly called T206s. I'm a baseball card collector, um, but Mo did not smoke. He played pickup baseball in his neighborhood, something that his father was not crazy about, but Mo was having enough academic success for it to not become an issue. He was voted the, quote, brightest boy in the school at age 16 when he graduated from high school. So 16 from high school. Mo spent one year at NYU, and he played baseball and basketball there before transferring to Princeton. He majored in modern languages. He certainly had a gift for languages, as you'll, you'll find out. He played shortstop at Princeton. Uh, he was fairly isolated and reportedly was a bit of a loner. Some of that may have been due to him being Jewish. Um, Anti-Semitism was a real thing. Still is a real thing, but it was definitely more pronounced um, earlier in the 1900s. Um, Mo did excel academically at Princeton. As I said, he had a gift for languages, and when he graduated, he had learned seven languages while at Princeton. Latin, Greek, French, Spanish, Italian, German, and Sanskrit. Plus, he came into it already knowing Hebrew and, of course, English. I won't get too much into his stats, but Mo hit 337 his senior year and played shortstop. After finishing at Princeton, Mo wanted to travel and see the places that he had only read about, but that required money. Fortunately for Mo, the Brooklyn Robins, which were previously the Brooklyn Trolley Dodgers, and then the Brooklyn Dodgers, and then eventually the LA Dodgers, but they were looking for a Jewish baseball player to draw in their Jewish fans uh, that were a big part of Brooklyn. And most signed on for $5,000 in 1923, which is $86,782 today. So a pretty nice salary. Bernard Berg, however, was not pleased. He wanted Mo to go to law school or to become a doctor like Mo's older brother, Sam. Mo played that rookie season at shortstop, and he struggled to hit 186 through 49 games. But he finished the season, and then he left for Paris in the offseason. Uh, once in Paris, Mo decided to enroll at the Sorbonne to further study his passion of languages. And while in Paris, there was a story that he was walking down the streets, and he bumped into Major League Baseball's John McGraw and Huey Jennings. And these guys could not believe that a catcher was spending his offseason 
in Paris at a university studying languages. So they brought that story back to the U.S. and kind of started the legend of, Mo of Moberg and his affinity for languages. Uh, so back back in the U.S. after that off season in 1924, Mo reported to spring training, and he failed to make the big league club. So he was sent to the Minneapolis Millers. He split 1924 between the Millers and the Toledo Mudhens, and then the Reading Keystones in 1925. Uh, in that off season in 1925, Mo enrolled at Ivy League Columbia and he took classes there in Spanish and French. So then we roll into 1926, and Charles Comiskey had a $6,000 option on Mo, and he exercised it, bringing Mo to Chicago and the White Sox. And Mo was not thrilled about that move, and he decided to skip spring training and go to law school. So he was getting pressure from his father, and the fact that he didn't make the big league club in the in the prior year probably had him thinking about backup plans, and law school was definitely a solid option. So he told Comiskey that he would join the team when the school year ended in May, and that's exactly what he did. He played sporadically that year through 41 games and then went back to Columbia in the offseason. In 1927, Comiskey was pressuring Mo, and he eventually caved and left law school to join the White Sox in spring training. He rode the bench again as a backup infielder for most of the season, but then an unlikely series of events ended up with three injured catchers. So Mo Berg, who hadn't caught at any organized level of baseball ever, found himself as the starting catcher. So he held his own. He hit 246 in 35 games to finish that season. He, he had a negative war, according to baseball reference, but given that he was the fourth catcher, that's not necessarily as bad as it seems. Uh, heading into 1928 and 29, Moe's career peaked. He played in 107 games in 29, uh, but then in 1930, he caught his spikes while running and tore his knee, basically ending his full-time catching opportunities. At the same time, he did successfully finish his law degree at Columbia. He played in 20 games in 1930, and then when the season ended, he went to work as a corporate lawyer in Manhattan. So he would work as a lawyer in New York during the off-season for three or four winters, and then return to play ball every spring. In 1931, Mo was put on waivers by the White Sox and picked up by the Indians. And Mo headed to Cleveland, and this is where I started reading some stories about some odd behavior, possibly some mental health issues going on. And as we get deeper into it, I believe that most likely all three of the Berg children had some sort of mental illness. They were all extremely intelligent, but all three had really strange, odd behaviors, and they were all, all three bit of loners. Uh, none, of them, none of them had families. Notably for Mo, the oddities started with his clothes. He wore a dark gray suit, black tie, black shoes, and a fedora. As Nicholas Davidoff points out in his book, Mo wore this suit almost like a uniform. He wore the same clothes every single day for the rest of his life. And his teammates were sure that he only had one suit, one shirt, and one tie. Another quirk that kept coming up, I kept reading about uh, time after time, was Mo and his penchant for newspapers. He would read every newspaper that he could get his hand on every day. He spent hours every day reading, reading them. He carried them around all day like they were prized possessions. Nobody could touch him. He was really sensitive about him. There was a story uh, later on when he was rooming with uh, Dominic DiMaggio, and DiMaggio had messed with his papers, and that was it. He was done. No more roommate. So throughout his life story, he's described as carrying newspapers under his arm. And uh, when he traveled, he had a suitcase dedicated just for newspapers. He would read them in the morning, as many as he, as he could buy again, and then in the afternoon when the afternoon editions were published. 
So, in summary of his career, in 32, Mo went to play for the Washington Senators, and that's about halfway through his career, and I'll go over the back half pretty quick. He spent two and a half years in Washington and then went back to Cleveland for the back half of 1934. Um, he played his last five years in Boston, only getting in 148 games over five years there. Uh, in his last nine years, he never even played half the games in a season. He was a career 243 hitter with six home runs over 19 seasons, and he struck out more than he walked. Uh, that, that last stat is it's not uncommon today, but in the 1930s, if you look at 1930s baseball, that just didn't happen all that often. It was rare to strike out that much. Well, the next phase of Moe's life is what makes him unique. As of January 28th, 2023, there have been 20,272 men who've played Major League Baseball since 1876. Of those 20,272 men, one man is celebrated in a small museum inside a building not open to the public in a peaceful Virginia town of Langley, headquarters of the CIA. Mo Berg. So how exactly does a baseball player end up working for the CIA, or at that time they were the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services? Well, let me go back a bit. Uh, an American missionary, Horace Wilson, introduced baseball to Japan in 1872. And for decades, the game grew in Japan. We know how popular it is there today. In 1913, Major League Baseball's Trish Speaker and John McGraw visited Japan, and then again in 1922. Then in 1931, a Japanese newspaper sponsored an American All-Star team to come and play Japanese college teams. Lou Gehrig and Lefty O'Doul were on that team, and then the following year, three players went to Japan to give seminars. O'Doul went as a hitting specialist, Ted Lyons to work with pitchers, and to work with catchers Mo Berg. So Mo reportedly spent two and a half weeks aboard a ship on the way to Japan, cramming as much Japanese as he could. And he impressed the Japanese when he arrived with his language ability, and he even learned to write some katakana. Uh, that 32 trip was significant, significant because it set the stage for Mo to come back two years later with a true all-star club. And in 1934, Major League Baseball sent... Future Hall of Famers Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Jimmy Fox, Lefty Gomez, back to Japan, as well as Mo Berg. And Mo had contracted with Movie Tone News from New York City to do some filming on the trip. And they sent along a movie, a 16 millimeter, what's it called? Uh, movie Tone, Movie Tone News camera, which ended up being no small thing. On the ship over, to Japan, the other players had played cards and socialized, and Mo isolated himself and continued to learn Japanese. Once in Japan, of course, Babe Ruth was the main attraction, and the Americans played 17 games in 12 Japanese cities in front of huge crowds, as many as 50,000 at a game. But uh, Mo carried that movie tone camera everywhere. He filmed everything. In Tokyo, he snuck up through a door at the top of a hospital and filmed the skyline, and he could see everything up there. He could, he could see the shipyard, uh, military installations, and industrial buildings all around the city. And it turns out that this film would serve almost as a gateway for Mo um, into the OSS. Uh, the newsreel that he, that he had gave the U.S. intelligence a rare look at Tokyo. Remember, this is before satellites existed. The B-25 Doolittle raid in 1942 reportedly used most footage in planning that famous attack. Uh, so when Mo left the Red Sox, it was in the service of the OIAA. This was the Office of Inter-American Affairs. And he was to work in Central and South America as a propaganda official in 1942 shortly after his father passed away. This wasn't exactly the role that he wanted, but uh, it was a stepping stone. And upon his return to the U.S., he had a meeting with Ellery Huntington. 
Ellery Huntington was a baseball fan and a fellow lawyer at Moe's firm, his early firm. However, he wasn't just some old law buddy. Uh, Mr. Huntington was now a colonel and deputy, direct, deputy director of operations for the OSS. So Colonel Huntington had sent a memo to the lieutenant commander of the OSS Special Ops, vouching for Moe and suggesting Moe Berg for field work. And on August 2, 1943, Moberg became a spy. Uh, while in South America, most Spanish greatly improved, as well as his Portuguese. And we know that he spoke French and had learned Japanese. His father taught him Hebrew and Yiddish. And as I previously said, he knew Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit from Princeton. And he also apparently dabbled in Slavic languages, Russian, Polish, and Bulgarian. He knew some Arabic, German, and even Mandarin Chinese. So clearly he was a gifted man, and what an asset he must have been when he hired into the OSS. Uh, his reward for that, his salary for 1943, $3,800. So less money than he made as a backup catcher at the end of his career. Welcome to government work, Mr. Bird. Uh, so OSS field training involved teaching agents everything from lock picking, codes, ciphers, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and even how to kill a man with various common instruments. Moe spent the latter part of 1943 and 1944, first in Italy and then various parts of Europe, trying to get scientists who had missile or rocket expertise to leave for the U.S. And he was successful in recruiting a number of key scientists. A year before Mo had joined the OSS, Robert Oppenheimer introduced the idea of kidnapping German scientist Werner Heisenberg in an effort to thwart Germany's chances of building a nuclear weapon. And by the time Mo joined the OSS, there were two missions in the planning stages for an abduction. Uh, the kidnapping scenarios were pretty complex. Through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, Davidoff, as I mentioned earlier, his book, he was able to learn that the proposal was to kidnap Heisenberg in Berlin, get to Switzerland on foot, and then from there a plane would fly over the Mediterranean where Heisenberg and the abductor would parachute into the water and be picked up by a submarine. Sounds real easy. Uh, yeah, so the eventual mission given to Mo was much simpler. Mo was sent to First of all, surveil Heisenberg. Uh, so he went to Rome and he tried to learn what all the German scientists were working on. And while doing that, Mo had learned that Heisenberg was going to be giving a lecture in Switzerland. So Mo's orders became really simple. Two, two orders. One, attend the lecture and ascertain whether a Heisenberg had the bomb. Two, if it's believed that Heisenberg has the bomb, assassinate Werner Heisenberg. So, I, I mean, I, just, I can't even imagine a, a baseball player just, that this is this guy's life. It's just crazy. But Moe's academic prowess paid incredible dividends um, to prepare for this Heisenberg lecture. He, remember, he was a language specialist. So he crammed nuclear physics. He studied quantum theory and mechanics. He poured over Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. He was briefed by rocket and guided missile specialists. He read doctoral level texts on neutrons and particle physics. And one Nobel Prize winning physicist who met Moe after the war remarked that Moe understood Heisenberg's uncertainty principle at least as well as he did. Meanwhile, Hitler's propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, excuse me, announced that the Nazis were working on a, quote, uranium torpedo. And on Berlin radio, Germans were threatening to, another quote, blow up half the world. So you could see how Moe's mission quickly became priority number one. Moe's crash course in physics paid off. Uh, Moe and his ability with languages. He attended this symposium posing as a Swiss physics doctoral student. Apparently his German accent had a... Uh, a touch of Swiss to it, so it fit the role perfectly. Uh, Mo 
struggle to keep up with the presentation. The physics being probably hurdle one, but then to have to hear it in German uh, must have taken an incredible intelligence just to follow along. Uh, but Mo worked his way uh, to an evening dinner with Heisenberg, uh, as well as some of the other lecture attendees. And he was convinced there that that evening that Heisenberg was not a Nazi uh, and that he did not have the bomb. Uh, Berg left the dinner with Heisenberg and they walked the city streets together talking. I just can't I, even imagine uh, that, that stroll. Heisenberg, there's no way that Heisenberg could have even possibly envisioned that the guy that he was walking with uh, was there to potentially kill him. Uh, Mo reportedly had a revolver in his pocket and a L tablet, L meaning lethal. It was a cyanide tablet that all OSS officers carried. So if he were, <coughs> excuse me, if he did, in fact, assassinate Heisenberg, he was supposed to take the uh, lithium tablet or the cyanide tablet and uh, commit suicide to protect OSS secrets. Uh, fortunately for Mo and for Heisenberg, and I guess for us, um, that didn't happen. And the Germans did not yet have the bomb. Mo was awarded the Medal of Freedom for his actions, but he declined to accept it. Uh, after the war, Harry Truman wanted to disband the OSS, and I was curious why, and I found an article written in 1995 by John Hollister Headley, a former CIA officer. Headley says that 18 days after the war was over, Truman issued an order to end the OSS, and he gave Bill Donovan, Wild Bill Donovan, 10 days to end all operations. Uh, but interestingly, only four months later, Truman created a central intelligence group and then eventually the CIA in 1947. So what was the motivation to kill the OSS? Well, Headley believes that either Truman was too optimistic about the idea of peace or he just simply did not like Bill Donovan and his swashbuckling way that he apparently ran the OSS. But no matter what the reason, the OSS was gone and Mo found himself without a purpose. So the structure in Mo's life was gone and as Davidoff puts in his book, Berg's life became one without calendar. Um, after the war, Mo seemed lost and he came from the war, unfortunately, to some serious IRS problems. The company that he was a um, founding investor in before the war went into debt and failed to pay its taxes. Moe's co-founder apparently had declared bankruptcy and washed his hands of his end of things, which Moe could have also done, but he refused on principle. He would not declare bankruptcy. And that decision really put pressure and stress on him the rest of his life. Uh, he did return to work for the CIA briefly in 1953. He was sent to Europe uh, in a similar role to what he was doing for World War II, uh, except this time he was to ascertain Soviet nuclear capabilities. Um, when his contract ended with the CIA that for that job, he stopped working completely. His total income for 1954 was $0, and he had $200 in a bank account uh, that he was living on as a wanderer. It seems odd that Mo didn't want to work. Um, he was offered jobs. He had coaching opportunities. He could have gone back to being a lawyer. Um, it almost feels like he had kind of lost his way and he was adrift. Um, at this time, his home base was with his older brother, Sam, uh, but he didn't really live there. He traveled all over, kind of dropping in on friends. And he would stay for days or, or sometimes even weeks uh, until he could kind of feel his, his welcome being worn out, and then he would move on somewhere else. And I read that story after story of him doing that, and he was basically had no luggage. Like, he was traveling with just the clothes on his back. Um, there were repeated stories of him washing his suit out every night in the bathroom sink, wherever he was. And I had never heard of that before, a wash and wear suit, but I found some old advertisements from the 1950s and it was a real thing. So the idea of wearing a suit and washing it in a sink with soap and then hanging it dry, uh, it was real. Very interesting. 
Uh, now we head into the final years. Uh, Mo had a he had a tough, strained relationship with his brother Sam. Even though Sam was nice enough to essentially support Mo after his CIA employ employment, uh, they were often at odds. And though that relationship was less than ideal, the relationship between Mo's brother and Mo's sister was terrible. They were they reportedly hated each other and didn't talk to each other for over 30 years, despite the fact that they lived basically around the block from each other. Uh, Sam had apparently begun to notice some declining health in Mo. Mo was bumping into things and spending long periods of time alone inside the house. He wouldn't get dressed for days. He wouldn't take phone calls. He wouldn't answer letters. And he was basically trying his best to avoid people. And he started napping a lot. And he couldn't keep up with his newspaper reading. Uh, so I guess Sam had pushed and pushed, and he at some point had had enough, and he asked Mo to leave. And Mo refused. He dug his heels in. He wouldn't leave. So Sam, I'm sure, didn't want to do this, but he ended up getting an eviction notice from his lawyer, and finally Mo left and moved in with his sister. Finally, in 1972, Mo fell out of bed and injured himself. And he refused treatment, but he stopped eating. And five days later, his sister admitted him to the hospital, and it turned out he had an aortic aneurysm. He was bleeding to death, and two days later, he was dead. His last words to a nurse that day were, How are the Mets doing today? So baseball to the end. So in the end, Mo loved baseball and he loved America. He put himself at great risk for this country. And at a time where he really could have easily just wrote out the rest of his career as a bench coach. It's sad to learn that his father never once attended any baseball game at Princeton or in professional baseball to see Mo play. His father also passed away before Mo started working for the OSS, so he didn't even know the impact that Mo had for his country. It's unfortunate that Mo never married or had children, nor did his brother or sister, so that branch of the Bird family tree ended that generation. Uh, but I'm sure there, there will probably never be another professional baseball player like Mo Berg. Uh, it was a very, very interesting story, an interesting read. If you are interested, I will include all of the source notes, um, the things I read online, but uh, the primary source of information was this book by Nicholas Davidoff. It's called The Catcher Was a Spy, and uh, I hope you check that out. I hope you enjoyed hearing about Mo's life, and I hope you tune in for episode three of the Athlete Archives. Thank you, and take care.